Hello everyone, welcome to our new video and in today's video I'll be discussing the chapter 9 The diseases of your circulatory system from I00 to your I99 So if you're new to my channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button Hit the notification bell so that you will be notified every time I have my new upload So um, don't forget to like and don't forget to share as well those videos that I have So if you're new um, in watching these videos don't forget to watch also the other videos that i have from chapter one to your chapter eight and the introduction to your icd 10 cm so brace yourself because this chapter is quite long so um and it's very important for us to understand this chapter because they love to ask questions about your chapter nine and even if you do the actual productions when you have your employment already you may encounter a lot from codes under your chapter 9 because common diseases that we may encounter nowadays includes your diseases of your circulatory system so let's start with your icd-10 chapter 9 diseases of your circulatory system so the very first one is your hypertension so your code for your hypertension is i10 or i10 that is the code for hypertension um it's also known as benign hypertension malignant hypertension you can go ahead and look at your tabular list and look for the category i10 okay and see the, what are those includes notes there so what are included what are the includes terms in this category this is your i10 keep in mind that you can only use i10 if the condition of the patient is already confirmed hypertension and it is already documented in the medical record by the provider okay remember that the elevation of blood pressure is not a guarantee that the patients already have a hypertension. It should be verbatim and it should be documented that the patients already have a hypertension. So if the diagnosis is hypertension alone, like the final diagnosis is hypertension, that's it. No other related conditions, no other complications other than hypertension. If the diagnosis is only hypertension alone, your code is I10. Now, if it's only an elevated blood pressure, we have a separate code for that and we should not be using I10. Okay? Next, the general guideline in your hypertension is, this is a very important guideline that you need to know. The classification presumes a causal relationship between hypertension and heart involvement and hypertension and kidney involvement what do you mean by that if there is a hypertension and there's also any heart diseases we can assume a causal relationship with them even if there's no linked or there's no documentation that linking them together because as per the general guideline we can presume a causal relationship between hypertension and heart involvement or and rather hypertension and kidney involvement because the two conditions are linked by the term with remember in your alphabetic index when you have this main term and you have a subterm with okay first invention is with and and sub sub invention anything below that with should be linked to the main term okay so that's why we can assume a causal relationship now the question is what are those heart involvements why are those kidney involvements Okay, so we will discuss further on as we discuss with the guideline. Now, the summary of this is like, if you have a hypertension and if you have a heart disease, 
that hype that heart disease is due to the hypertension or that hypertension is due to that heart disease or vice versa so they go hand in hand most of the time those complications those conditions go hand in hand same thing with hypertension and kidney involvement remember we're talking about circulatory so it involves the whole body okay and the worst case complication of most of the time of hypertension that's why we need we really need to control the hypertension is your heart involvement your kidney involvement or your vital organ failure so these conditions should be coded as related even in the absence of provided documentation explicitly linking them unless the documentation clearly states that the conditions are unrelated okay so if there's no documented documentation at all that they those are unrelated we can presume or we can assume a causal relationship so i'll go ahead and check your alphabetic index just so you have an idea what i'm talking about hey so when you go to your i10 remember your category i10 your code i10 hypertension hypertensive, accelerated, benign hypertension, essential hypertension, idiopathic or malignant or systemic hypertension, those are still coded to your I-10. When, when, when you see an indention, when you go down, actually I cut this one because this is very long, go ahead and go to your first indent, don't go to your, okay, sub-sub indention, go to the first indention with okay so anything below this with should be linked to your to your hypertension anything below the word with because remember with is the same as due to or the same as associated to okay so meaning if it's heart failure and hypertension or heart disease or hypertension and hypertension your category should be i11 if there's in heart involvement okay if there's kidney involvement see hypertension kidney okay so we have this word with here that linking them together that's why we can presume a causal relationship okay are we clear with that okay so next, let's move on to your first or second guideline rather. For hypertension and conditions not specifically linked by the rational term as such as with, <clears throat> associated with, or due to in the classification provider, documentation must link the doc conditions in order to code them as related. Not everyone should be linked together. As we can only link them if it is below the word with. Okay, not, not all heart diseases. Keep in mind, okay, not every time you see a heart disease and hypertension, you can go ahead and link them together. Not every time. You still need to check your index if it's below your word width. Okay, but as per your guideline, as you can see, the common examples, heart involvement, hypertension, kidney involvement. So keep in mind that you do, do not forget this guideline before getting your correct i mean your your final codes okay next first guideline under your hypertension hypertension with heart disease okay on this is category i11 remember a while ago when if it's hypertension alone it should be i10 remember see the hierarchy now if this is hypertension with heart disease your category should now be i11 so it's going up i mean the hierarchy i11 let's see if there's i12 i13 later on so hypertension with heart conditions classified to i50 so this uh, i mentioned a while ago that not all heart diseases i mean not all heart diseases can be linked to hypertension right away these are only the categories that should be that sh that we will going to presume or that we will going to assume a causal relationship if you see an i10 okay in your choices if we see an i10 and that i10 is together with these codes i50 i51.4 i51.7 i51.89 or i51.9 that is automatically wrong 
because they should be assigned to code from category I-11. So meaning, from the word hypertension, heart disease, anything, any the, the codes under this word heart disease are these categories. I-50, I-51.4, I-51.7, I-51.89, and I-51.9. The guidelines tell us a very specific categories or subcategories that we can link together with hypertension and we should not code them separately we will going to use the category i11 use additional code for category i50 heart failure to identify the type of heart failure in those patients with heart failure because remember if the patient has a heart disease the common complication that may end up is to your heart failure so not all cases like patients has this heart failure so don't forget to always see the documentation if there's already a heart failure or there's none now how would you know if there's a heart failure if there's and, and no heart failure at all they will always document if there's already a heart failure okay so i have a couple of examples here hope hope this will help you guys so a patient visit a patient visits his cardiologist for follow up visit he is being treated by the cardiologist for hypertension and acute diastolic heart failure now okay how many codes do we need to code or what should be our code so the the diagnosis is being treated with hypertension an acute diastolic heart failure so there's a hypertension and there's a heart disease this is your acute diastolic heart failure so i guess we need to call the category i mean i'm sure that we need to call the category i11 correct i11.0 hypertensive heart disease with heart failure and remember in your guideline a while ago that if there is a heart failure, we need to use the category or add an additional code for the category I-50, which is your I-50.31, Acute Diastolic Congestive Heart Failure. Okay, next. A patient visits his cardiologist today. He is being treated with hypertensive heart disease. Now, the, in this scenario, the word hypertensive heart disease is automatically we're going to use I-11. Now, the question is, is there a heart failure? No, there's no heart failure. So, we have an option for hypertensive heart disease without heart failure. Okay? So, hopefully, that is clear. Now, let's move on to your next guideline under your hypertension. Um, before moving on, the same heart conditions, I-50, 51, 50. To your I-51.9 with hypertension are coded separately if the provider has documented that they are unrelated to hypertension. And the sequencing should be the circumstances of encounter. Now, if there's no documentation linking them together, we can assume. But if there's a very specific um, documentation that you cannot, those conditions are unrelated, you can code them separately. Okay? Hypertensive chronic kidney disease I-12. So assign codes from category I-12 hypertensive chronic kidney disease when both hypertension and a condition classifiable to your category N-18. By the way, your, your code for CKD or chronic kidney diseases is your category N-18 if present. Now, a while ago, we're talking about hypertension and heart disease. That is I-11. Now, the next one is I-12 when we are talking about hypertension and CKD, okay? Hypertension and chronic kidney disease. CKD should not be coded as hypertensive if the provider indicates that the CKD is not related, of course, because we can only, if there's a specific documentation that those conditions are not related, you cannot assume a causal relationship because it's already stated that it is not related but if there's no documentation at all that those conditions are not related we can assume a causal relationship between your hypertension and your ckd and your category should be i12 and another guideline in keep in mind 
put a note in your book that if you have used the category I-12, you should always code an appropriate code for category N-18 should be used as a secondary code with a code I-12 to identify the stage of CKD. If there's no stage, you still need to use for your N-18 and use your unspecified stage. Keep in mind, I-12 should always be two codes. You cannot code I-12 alone, okay? Because you always need to code for your N-18. Now, if you forget this guideline, you have an instructional note when you go to your subcategory I-12 to always code an additional for your N-18. Okay, your N18, we will we'll be discussing this one as we go through your chapter 14. If the patient has hypertensive chronic kidney disease and acute renal failure, an additional code for acute renal failure is required. Code it separately. If there's an acute and chronic, okay, if there's an acute renal failure separately, you may code it separately. Okay, um, next one, we're done with I10, I11. I-12, and now we are now on your I-13. I-13, hypertension, it's now the combination of both. There's a hypertension, there's a heart disease, and there's a CKD. Okay, a sign code from combination in category I-13 for hypertensive heart and chronic kidney disease. When there's a hypertension with both heart and kidney involvement, you need to code your I-13. Same guideline, if there's a heart failure, code it separately. If there's a CKD, the stage of CKD, you should always code it separate. Actually, you should always code your CKD here. In your I-13, same thing with your I-12. But the differences here is there's a heart disease. Remember your guideline for, for, your, for your hypertensive heart disease that we need to code for category I-50 if there's a heart failure. If there's no heart failure, it's two code only. But if it's with heart failure, you need to have three codes because you need to have a code for I-13, you need to code for your CKD, and you need to code for your heart failure. Now, if it's only hypertension, heart, and CKD, and there's no heart failure, I-13 and N-18. Correct? Okay. Now, why do we need to always specify or to always read the whole scenario? Because in the exam, they love to put in a scenario that the initial diagnosis is hypertension alone. At the middle of the scenario, they will tell you that there is a heart disease. Oh, I'm good, I'm good, I need to code I-11 because there's a heart disease. And here comes at the end of the scenario, they will put in that the patient also has a CKD. Remember, we have an option for hypertension, heart, and CKD, and that should be I-13. Okay, always read the whole scenario. Now, what I usually do during the exam, if I saw an options like I-13 in the choices, oh, I need to look for the keyword hypertension, heart, disease, and CKD. Okay, so if I see those two conditions already with, with hypertension, automatically you need to use your I-13. Okay? That's it for your hypertension. Another guidelines for hypertension are quite pretty straightforward. Okay. So the codes in category I-13 hypertensive heart and chronic disease are combination codes that include hypertension, heart, and CKD. It just repeats the guideline. The includes notes in your I-13 specified that the condition includes at I-11 and I-12 already together in your I-13. So if you forget your guideline, there's always included in your includes notes. Do not forget to always read in the tabular list. This is very important, but you know, as you go through the selection of your codes in the actual exam, you may end up choosing only seeing a certain code and you can, unlock, can no longer see other codes there or other instructional notes there. Be very careful. If the patient has hypertension, heart disease, and chronic kidney disease, then a code from I-13 should be used, not individual code. Because remember, it's a combination code. Remember your guideline for combination code. If there's a combination code exists, use that combination code exists first, and you know you don't need to code them separately. Okay? Next. 
hypertensive cerebrovascular disease. Now, remember if there's a hypertension, the common common problem here is if you have a hypertension, there is like, you know, um constriction of the vessels. Okay, that's the common problem with hypertension because there's an increase, you know, pressure already, pressure already, and the common effective there is our small vessels. Okay, and common that we have a lot of vessels going through the brain. So the common complication of your heart hypertension is most of the time is your cerebrovascular disease, which may lead to your cerebrovascular accident or your stroke, correct? If there's a blockage already of your blood going to your brain, your cerebrovascular disease may result to your cerebrovascular accident or your stroke. So for hypertensive cerebrovascular disease, first assign the category I60 to I69 followed by the appropriate hypertension code. Okay, I60 to I69, what do you need to remember there is your category I63 because that is where you can see the code for your stroke. Okay, if there is a cerebrovascular heart disease, you also need to code for the hypertension. If it's I10, I11, I12, I13, same guideline. Okay, next. Hypertensive retinopathy. As I mentioned, there's a constriction of vessels. So the supply of blood already to those small vessels may be interrupted or lessened. So the common complication, what do you mean by retinopathy? When we say retina, it is where the blood supply of the eyes. Okay, you can see there the small vessels going through the eyes now the common complication if there's no longer any blood supply to your retina that may lead of course to your word retinopathy or disease of the retina okay next now they need to be very specific that it should be hypertensive retinopathy before we can use the code h35.0 the documentation should be specific that the retinopathy is related to your hypertension because there are different causes of your retinopathy. And if there's, you should be used with code for I10, I15, hypertensive disease to include the systemic hypertension. I10 to I15. You still need to code for the I10 and I15 together with your H35.0 so that you, your, your, your coding should be complete. Because you need to specify that the retinopathy is due to the hypertension. So you need to code to have, you need to have a code for H35.0 and an I10 to I15 to specify that that is a hypertensive retinopathy. Now the question, what should be the sequence saying? It is based on your reason for encounter. So it doesn't matter. It could be H35.0 or it could be your I10 to I15. Okay? Hypertension secondary. I mean, what do you mean by this? It is not the same with secondary diabetes. This is your hypertension, comma, secondary. What do you mean by this? Okay. Um, it's just like the hypertension is due to underlying condition. Meaning the patient may not suffer hypertension if there's no underlying condition at all. Okay, that's why the hypertension is called secondary because it is caused by other condition. Remember, if it is caused by others' condition, there should always be two codes. Okay, secondary hypertension is due to an underlying condition. So two codes are required. The one is either to identify the underlying etiology or the underlying condition and the category I-15 to identify the hypertension. Now, the sequencing should be based on the reason for encounter, okay? Hypertension transient or transient TIA, or this is an elevated blood pressure only. This is your R03.0 for elevated BP reading without diagnosis of hypertension. So, and you also have code 013, gestational pregnancy induced hypertension or your preeclampsia. We will be going to discuss this one in your chapter 15, okay? So, keep in mind, they love to ask this in the actual exam. Your R03.0, like, um, they usually use the word hypertension in the scenario, 
But usually they will tell you the patient has no hypertension. Okay? The patient is being diagnosed with elevated blood pressure and the patient has no hypertension. Remember, if you're just reading, you know, if just if you are just looking for keywords and you see the word hypertension there, oh, it should be I-10. And you forget to read the word no, oh my God. You may be, end up using or choosing the wrong uh, choices. Choice, okay? Wrong answer. So you always need to be very careful again with your keyword. I understand that the exam is really a time pressured exam, but slow but sure, okay? Next, hypertension controlled. Obviously, when it's case, say controlled, it is being controlled by therapy or by your maintenance, okay? Medications. There's no um other guideline with this one. There's no specific guideline with this. Even if it's your controlled or uncontrolled, it's still coded to your category I-10 to your I-15. Before, when we have your ICD-9, it matters if it's controlled or uncontrolled. But to your ICD-10, it's no longer matter if it's controlled or uncontrolled. But it's very important in the documentation in the medical record if it's controlled or uncontrolled, especially if the patient is your have your CCM or chronic care management regarding her hypertension. This is very important in the MIPS, your, your merit-based incentive payment system. So that's very important if it's controlled already or uncontrolled, okay? Next, hypertensive crisis. When we say crisis, it is the state. Like what we have now, like we have the pandemic crisis, the COVID-19 crisis. It is the state or the condition now. So assign a code from category I-16, hypertensive crisis for documented hypertensive urgency. If you see those words, hypertensive urgency, hypertensive emergency, or hypertensive unspecified hypertensive crisis, you need to code your category, use your category I-16, okay? You need to see those keywords before you will going to use your I-16. And you can also add an additional code for hypertension because you cannot have a hypertensive crisis we don't have any hypertension at all. Now, the sequencing is based on the reason for encounter. But it is quite, you know, I'm quite puzzled with this guideline that they should always base on the sequencing based on the reason for encounter because if the patient has an intense uh, you know hypertensive crisis most of the time that's the reason why the patient came into the er right so it, most of the time it should be hypertensive crisis should be the code at first but sometimes if it's very specific that the cause the first listed diagnosis is hypertension so we need to code the hypertension first because it's allowed because based on the reason for encounter as per your guideline so we that is the end of your hypertension guideline if you have any questions don't forget to put your comments below before we proceed with the next part of your guideline which is your letter b guideline okay so we I think this is new for 2019 and 2020 so i just need to put in your pulmonary hypertension your category i27 okay and your common example, I mean, co common reason why the patient may encounter pulmonary hypertension is due to your drugs or toxins or toxic effects or adverse effect of your medications. When I say pulmonary hypertension, guys, it is your increase of blood pressure within the lungs only. That's why it says pulmonary. And we have a category for this, which is your I-27. Letter B guideline. Atherosclerotic, coronary, artery disease, and angina. When we see atero, it's a plaque. Okay? Formation of plaque or formation of your fat deposits. That's why, guys, it's very important to have your exercise, especially during this quarantine season. So, you always need to do your exercise, guys. Don't forget to have your exercise daily because that's very that's very helpful to our heart. So when we say coronary, coronary is the vessels within the heart. All vessels within the heart is called coronary vessels. 
Okay, so we are particularly talking now about the heart. Okay, the vessels of the... Remember, we're talking about circulatory system. It involves the heart and the blood vessels. So when we are talking about coronary arteries, we are talking about the arteries of the heart. Okay, and we are talking about diseases. And when we say angina, it's the same as chest pain. Okay? Chest pain. Okay. Now, remember the pathophysiology of your heart attack or your angina. Okay, like for example, if there's a blockage already, there's a formation of plaque in those blood vessels going to your heart. Okay. So the common complication of that that of that is there's a decreased supply of blood already to your heart correct now if there's a decrease heart supply of blood in your heart this may lead to your ischemia okay ischemia and that ischemia may lead to your you know muscle your your infarction okay so usually the common signs and symptoms, if there's an ischemia or, or lack of blood supply or lessened supply of blood vessels already to the heart, the common complication of that or the signs and symptoms of that is your angina or your chest pain. It is automatic that there's a blockage of, of fat deposits or atherosclerosis in your blood vessels going to your heart. It may lead to your angina. And that angina may end up your having your myocardial infarction or your heart attack. So ischemia and that uh, signs and symptoms is angina. If you if we haven't resolved the ischemia or the blockage, if we were not able to create a graph, okay, it may lead to your infarction or your myocardial heart attack or myocardial infarction so since i mentioned that it's automatic like if there's a blockage of blood supply going to your heart there is your ict 10 cm as a combination code for atherosclerotic heart disease with angina pectoris because these are related most of the time i mean it is automatic like if there's an atherosclerosis there's also an angina because there's the signs and symptoms there's already a lessened supply of blood vessels to the heart and that causes your chest pain or your angina pectoris there are different type of angina they should put in your um, the documentation should always specify what type of angina it is if it is a stable angina or still up or it is unstable angina the subcategories for the codes are I-25.11. So, your, put a note in your letter B, your atherosclerotic coronary artery disease is under your category I-25. Okay? I-25. Okay? So, under your subcategories with your I-25, we have two options, I-25.11 and I-25.7. I need you to highlight the difference for your I-25.11. <laughs> It is atherosclerotic heart disease of the native coronary artery with angina pectoris. It's a combination already, so you don't need to report your angina separately. And I-25.7 is atherosclerotic chlorosis of coronary artery bypass graft. When we say native, it's your, you know, innate artery. It's your normal arteries. It's your native arteries there. When we say coronary artery bypass graft, what do you mean by this? You can't have your I-25.7. You cannot code for I-25.7 without any cabbage procedure before. I mean, there's no if there's no coronary artery bypass be, graft being done before. Because the problem with your I-25.7, we and the patient undergone, um, undergo a procedure which is your coronary artery bypass. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that bypass grafting also also encountered atherosclerosis. There's also a blockage. So like, oh my God, it's a double, you know. We created a graft, but you know, there's, already, there's also a fat deposit already on that graft. So, you know, um, like the condition is really severe because, you know, um, there's atherosclerosis already to the bypass graft, 
Okay, but the, you always take note that um, you cannot code I-25.7 if there's no procedure such as coronary artery bypass graft before. Okay, so you always need to check your history when you use your I-25.7. They need to specify that. Okay, when using one of this combination code, it is not necessary to use an additional code for angina as per your guideline a while ago. Because a causal relationship can be assumed in a patient with both atherosclerosis and angina unless the documentation indicates that the angina is due to something other than atherosclerosis. I explained this already that it is already assumed that if there's a blockage or there's an atherosclerosis, this may lead to your ischemia and that ischemia caused your signs and symptoms which is your angina. And if it's not relieved or if it's not managed, it will lead to your myocardial infarction. Okay? Next, if the patient, like for example, there's a CAD, what I mean, your coronary artery disease, they usually use the word CAD, C-A-D. Coronary artery disease is admitted due to an acute myocardial infarction, AMI. The AMI should be sequenced before the coronary artery disease because AMI is severe, more severe than your CAD. Even if the cause of your AMI is CAD, you need to code first the AMI because they need to manage first the AMI before the CAD. Okay, but you still need to code for the CAD if that's also the reason for encounter. Okay, you need to code them both. Code first your AMI because that is more severe and that should be managed first before your CAD. Okay, yeah. Next, intraoperative and post-procedural cerebrovascular accidents. When we are talking about this one, when we say intraoperative during the surgery, post-procedural obviously from the keyword post, it's after the surgery. Now, the patient suffered cerebrovascular accident or stroke during the surgery or after the surgery. Now, keep in mind that this is a complication, right? The patient suffered cerebrovascular accident due to your surgery being done. Is it during the surgery or after the surgery? That's why, guys, it's very important in the medical record documentation that it should clearly specify the cause and effect. Because remember, as a coder, we cannot assume that that is uh, that the stroke is actually related to surgery. Okay, the uh, provider should admit and should clearly specify the cause and effect that that is due to the surgery intra or during the surgery or after. The surgery okay the other thing that you also need to know when you are coding cerebrovascular accident like, uh, other than be, if it's intra or post operative or post procedural you always need to uh, for proper code assignment you always need to know if it's infarction or hemorrhagic remember we have two types that, like they always tell us like ischemic stroke versus hemorrhagic stroke okay some patients survive hemorrhagic stroke if like if the vessels in the nose is the one who is ruptured common um common patient that 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 dies during your cerebrovascular accident if it's the vessel going to the brain is being ruptured that is your hemorrhagic if there's a rupture of your vessel going to the brain due to the increased pressure remember there's a hypertension here there's an increased pressure um, going to the brain, your vessels may rupture and they may, you may end up having your hemorrhagic cerebrovascular accident or your hemorrhagic stroke. The infarction or also known as ischemic stroke is there's a blockage of your vessel going to the brain that may end up having your cerebrovascular accident. If it was for cerebral hemorrhage, code assignment depends on the procedure performed. This is common also when they are performing any uh, brain surgery, okay, brain procedures that may also uh, lead to your hemorrhagic stroke, okay? Sequela of cerebrovascular accident. It's very, very common that there is a sequela. When we say sequela, it's a late effect, okay? It is the late effect or the neurologic deficits caused by your cerebrovascular accident. Remember, the common complication of your cerebrovascular accident is like your hemiplegia, your your uh, right-sided weakness. Remember that? Or it can be all throughout the body, paraplegia, or it can be left-sided, weakness only, or, you know, 
So that's why the patients having your cerebrovascular accident sustain your skilled nursing facility and they should undergo rehabilitation. So there's a neurologic deficit. So your code is for that is your I-69. Now, if it's still current, like the stroke is still acute, that's why it's called acute. Okay, cerebrovascular accident is still coded to your I-60 to I-67. But if it's already, the acute phase is no longer there. Um, it's already healed, but there's your late effect or the neurologic deficits due to your stroke. We can now use your category I-69. I see the late effects include neurologic deficit that persists after initial onset of the condition classifiable to I-63, I-60 to I-67. The neurologic deficits caused by the cerebrovascular accident or disease may be present from the onset or may arise at any time after the onset of the condition classifiable to your I-60 to I-67. So you always need to code for I-69 if there is neurologic deficit. However, keep in mind that there are patients like even if they have the neurologic deficit now, it can be healed. You know, as time goes by, as therapies goes by, it can be healed. Okay, it may be healed. Okay, so um, if it's already healed, you can no longer code for I-69. You can only use your I-69 if the neurologic deficit is still present. Keep in mind with that. Put a note that you can only use your I-69 if the neurologic deficit is still present or the conditions produced by your stroke is still present, which is your hemiplegia or hemiparesis. Okay, codes from category I-69 uh, may be assigned on healthcare record with I-6066. We can still use your I-69 if there's like, for example, if there's a current stroke, I mean, there's a past stroke, and that cause neurologic deficit, and there's all, there's also another current stroke. Because remember, patients may suffer multiple stroke. Like if if they have this initial stroke, and there's a condition being produced by that by that first stroke, past stroke, you can use I sixty nine, and the patient may suffer also current stroke again. So you need to code I sixty and I sixty seven followed by your I-69. Keep in mind in your coding, you always need to code the current first, followed by the past. You know, your priority should be your, your present, not the past. If it's past, past is past, okay? But you still need to code for that, okay? How can you get rid, get rid with the past? Okay, so you still need to code for I-69 if it's still present, correct? But if it's no longer present, you can no longer use your I-69, which is related to this next guideline. Code from category I-69 and personal history of transient ischemic attack. Now, if it's like I mentioned a while ago, that if the neurologic deficit is, is being healed already, or already healed, we can now consider it as a personal history. And you can no longer use I-69. We will now going to use your Z86.73, your personal history of transient ischemic attack and cerebral infarction. Code from category C, I-69 should not be assigned as the patient does not have neurologic deficit already. See, that means I-69 can never be coded with Z86.73. Correct? Okay, so always check your scenario if there's still an existing neurologic deficit or no longer have your neurologic deficit, okay? I think this is the last part of your Chapter 9 guidelines, your acute myocardial infarction or also known as your AMI, a a a -me or AMI, okay? Acute myocardial infarction. Now, when we are talking about myocardial infarction, since 2019, I think, or 2018, they, they release the different types of your myocardial infarction. We have type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, and type 5. Okay, but in this guideline, uh, I think in this uh, ICD-10 guideline, uh, we will particularly tackle your type 1, okay? Um, type 1 ST, remember your QRST in your ECG? Uh, I don't have an image here, but you may search it like your QRST or your ECG, okay, ST elevation. Your ST should not be elevating because if that is elevating, that is an indication that there's a myocardial infarction. 
Okay, that is the sign. That's why it's an emergency when you go to the ER and there's an ST elevation, hey, automatic ICU. Okay, because they could because they need to maintain, I mean they need to manage it right away your myocardial infarction. And there are different types. We have a type 1 ST elevation myocardial infarction or your STEMI. Okay. And non-ST, oh, when you say non-ST, it's depression. When you say ST elevation myocardial infarction. And non ST elevation myocardial infarction in S N STEM me. The ICD 10 CM codes for type 1, acute, we're talking about type 1, acute myocardial infarction, identify the site, such as anterolateral wall or through posterior wall. Highlight this one anterolateral wall and through posterior wall. When you go to your cat subcategories I21.0 to I21.2 and code I21.3, go ahead and check for that. I21.0 and your I20 to I21.2 and code I21.3. The codes are being differentiated depending on the site if it's anterolateral wall or through posterior wall. Remember, if the patients may encounter myocardial heart, myocardial infarction, or acute myocardial infarction, there's the death of your heart muscles. Okay? It doesn't mean that the whole muscle is already dead. It is the, it's a part of your heart is being dead, or it's dead, okay, uh, muscles due to your myocardial infarction. Now, now, if there's a dead muscle there, remember your heart should be sequencing, I mean, desynchronized de in the pumping. It cannot be unsynchronized because that may lead to your, you know, heart attack still. It should be synchronized that all muscles should be functioning well. Now, if there's a death of your muscle in your heart, okay, obviously, it may end up no longer functioning. It may end up, or it may stop pumping already. Okay? So, there are two common part of your heart that is being uh, affected during your myocardial infarction, which is your anterolateral wall and your third posterior wall, okay? And that is for STEMI. For code I21.4 is for your N-STEMI elevation myocardial infarction. So you may encounter a lot from I21, category I21, if we're talking about myocardial infarction. So be careful that they should always specify that type. Okay, so as I say, uh, as we mentioned, that we need to identify the site of your um, myocardial infarct. What if there's no site being indicated? Okay, so before moving on in this guideline, I'll just go ahead in this uh, very important guideline. If type 1 in STEMI evolves to STEMI due to a therapy, assign the code STEMI. If a type 1 STEMI converts to N-STEMI due to thrombolytic therapy, it's still coded STEMI. So just put in the default, whatever happens is still coded as STEMI. Right? In this guideline, just put in a note there, default is STEMI. If a type 1 STEMI evolves to STEMI, assign the STEMI code. If a STEMI converts to N-STEMI due to thrombolytic therapy, it's still coded to STEMI. So your default is your STEMI. Okay. Uh, please put a highlight here that you can only use your category I-21 within the four weeks time frame. You can only use I-21 if the heart attack happens within the 24 weeks only. If it's That's why it's called acute. The acute phase is only 24 weeks or very specific. 28 days okay after that 28 days or four weeks we can no longer use the i21 because the acute phase of heart attack usually happens within the four weeks time frame okay so that's the summary of this guideline here for encounters Occurring while the myocardial infarction is equal to or less than four weeks old, including transfer to another acute setting or post-acute setting, the myocardial infarction meets the definition of other diagnosis. Codes from category I-21 may continue to be reported, but if it's no longer within the four weeks time frame, we can no longer code for I-21. As per your next 
guideline for encounters after four week time frame and the patient is still receiving care for the myocardial infarction the appropriate after care code should be assigned rather than the category for i21 your after care code should be you coded using your z codes we have an after care z codes we will going to discuss that in your chapter 21 now, there are also patients that may have your old or healed myocardial infarction not requiring further care. You have your code for I-25.2. Old myocardial infarction may be assigned. This is very important. I guess you um, this is common mistake when we do the HCC coding. Okay, we always need to capture I-25.2 if there's an old myocardial infarction because this may increase. Okay, this may affect your risk factor okay acute myocardial infarction unspecified remember they need to put uh, they need to specify what type if they did not specify what type what's uh, what type of the myocardial infarction is this use your i21.9 if they did not specify if it's STEMI or NSTEMI use your i21.9 but if only type 1, if they, in your I-21.9, use that if they did not specify the type of, hyper, uh, of your myocardial infarction, correct? If here, if only type 1, STEMI or transmural MI without the site, if they specify the type, but they did not specify the site if it's antero or posterolateral wall. You need to code your I-21.3. Clear? Uh, I think you need to highlight. I, I'm just highlighting the difference. This, this guideline highlighted the difference between I-21.9 and I-21.3. And this I-21.9, remember the different types of your acute myocardial infarction. They did not specify the type of your myocardial infarction. But for I-21.3, they specify the type, but they did not specify the site. Because remember, when you are coding your myocardial infarction, you need to know the type and you need to know the site. Correct? Yes. Okay? Next. AMI documented as non-transmural or sub-endocardial but site provided. It is still coded under your sub-endocardial AMI. Okay? Subsequent acute myocardial infarction. What do you mean by this? Um, this is specifically for type 1 because we have a different uh, code for type 2, type 3, and type 4. Okay? Um, when we say subsequent acute myocardial infarction, remember your time frame for your um, myocardial infarction is 4 weeks. There is a subsequent heart attack within that 4 weeks time frame. Oh my god, this is a double kill. Okay, there's your heart attack um, happened and there's another heart attack happened during that 4 week time frame. So how would you call that? Because there's already two, uh, two myocardial infarctions. So, a code from category I-22, subsequent ST elevation and non-ST elevation myocardial infarction is to be used when the patient who has suffered a type 1 or unspecified AMI has a new AMI within the 4-week time frame of the initial AMI. So, here, since it's still 4 weeks time frame, we still need to code for I-21, correct? Yes. So a code from category I-22 must be used in conjunction with your I-21. Because remember, it happens within the four weeks. And we can still code for I-21 within the four weeks time frame. Now, the question, who should you go into sequence first? Sequencing is based on the circumstances for encounter. Or the patient is already in the hospital, I guess, if it's already a heart attack. So your keyword here, the first listed code, should always be the focus of treatment. Right? Yes. Okay? Next, do not assign code from category I-22 because your I-22 is only for type 1. Just put a note there that your I-22 is for type 1 only and unspecified. I mean, you just need to highlight this one. Type 1 or unspecified only. 
Because if you have your other than type 1, we have type 2, we should assign I21.A1 only. We only have one code. Unlike with type 1, we have two codes. For type 2, we have your one code only, I21A1. For type 4 and type 5, we have I21A9. Okay? If a subsequent myocardial infarction of one type occurs within the four weeks of myocardial infarction of a different type, assign the appropriate codes for I category I21 to identify each type. Do not code for I22 because code from category I22 should only be assigned if both initial and subsequent are both type 1 or unspecified. Okay? Like if there are two hyper uh, two heart attack being being uh the suf patient suffered two, two types of heart attack. We need to code for I-21 and a different code for the different type. We can only use your I-22 if it's the same type. And, excuse me, or it is unspecified. Okay? Other types of your myocardial infarction, you have your type 1 myocardial infarction assigned to I21.0 to I21.4. Your type 2 should be your I21.A1. Myocardial infarction type 2. You have your type 2 AMI described by NSTB or NSTEMI. Only assign the A21.A1. Code I21.01 to I21.4 should not be assigned for type 1 AMIs. Okay? Uh, other uh, acute myocardial infarction type 3, 4, A, 4, B, 4, C, and 5 are assigned to category I21.89. A code also and code first note should be followed related to complication and for coding of your post-procedural myocardial infarction during or following cardiac surgery. Same, same with your cerebrovascular accident a while ago. Okay, that ends up your chapter 9 and up next we will be discussing your chapter 10 diseases of your respiratory disease system and we'll try to discuss chapter 12. Actually, we don't have a guideline for chapter 11 so we may go ahead and in my next video I'll discuss chapter 10, chapter 11 even if there's no guideline, 12 and 13. Hopefully, I can go up to your 14 because those are just short guidelines. Okay? So, stay tuned, guys. Hopefully, you're having fun in your studies. Okay? So, good luck in your studies and God bless.